Hello and welcome to Offspring Magazine, the podcast. I'm your host, Srinathram Kumar. Joining me today as a co-host is Leonie Keller. Hello. So, Leonie and I had the chance to have a rather interesting discussion with uh, Professor Jan Dietrich Werner, who's fondly known as Jan Werner, who was the former Director General for the European Space Agency, or ESA. And he's currently the president of the German National Academy of Science and Engineering, ACATECH. So, in our discussion, we learned quite a few things and it was quite interesting, don't you think, Leonie? Yes, I think we had a quite interesting discussion and his career path is actually fascinating. I completely agree with that. So, I think let's hear directly from the man himself. And without any further ado, let's get on with the discussion with Professor Werner. Professor Werner, thanks a lot for joining us on Offspring Magazine, the podcast. It's an absolute pleasure to have you with us today. Perhaps as a quick first step, could you please introduce yourself and tell us about your current work? My name is Jan Werner. I'm a civil engineer by uh, education and uh, right now I'm uh, also in my private engineering office as well as uh, I'm the president of the National Academy for Science and Engineering. How did you arrive at your current position? My car. No. Uh, so <laughs> were... I was expecting an answer like this from you. <laughs> there were several steps, uh, and most of them by accident. So uh, I went to school, uh, finished school. Then I was thinking about what to study. There were several options, uh, either a, a priest, meaning a minister, or to become a teacher or to become an engineer or a doctor. Finally, I decided to become an engineer. So I started in Berlin and uh, Darmstadt uh, and became a civil engineer. And then I went to a civil engineering office in Frankfurt. From there, back to the university as a professor. Five years later, I was elected president of that university. And as a president of the university, I was asked to participate in what is called the Senate of the German Aerospace Center. And being there for one or two years, um, they asked me to become the chairman of the executive board of the German Aer Aerospace Center. And after another eight years, uh, I moved to the European Space Agency, where I stayed for nearly six years. Okay, that's a very fascinating uh... Short crux of your history. No, it looks very straight on, but it wasn't. I can tell you Definitely. there were several hurdles in my life uh, where it was really difficult to, to go forward. And I had a lot of uh, also failures, etc., etc. So don't Definitely. look into it uh, like a straight career. It was not. Definitely. So uh, this is one of the reasons why we kind of split our... Uh, discussion topics with you in, in into certain categories. So we, we first want to talk to you about your early career. Then we'll talk about your interest in aerospace and aviation. Then your tenure at ESA and then your correct current position at Akatech. So we, we first start with the early career. So you mentioned that you studied civil engineering in, in TU Berlin and Darmstadt. So what was your motivation to pick civil engineering? So as I, as I mentioned, there were several options. Uh, and... Um... I looked into what is really what can you do in the different uh, in the different business in the different areas and uh, becoming an engineer you can really think about something and you can realize it directly you you realize your ideas in 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 stones in concrete and in steel and in wood so and this was something I wanted to to do and in addition my father was a civil engineer who died when I was 13 but so he was something like a role model for me. So this also uh, brings us to another question, like role models um, or mentors, like was there a ro like which role did mentorship play during your early career or the, in general also? So there is, there is an inherent role model or mentorship of my parents, yes, which, which I could not 
live because my father died when I was 13. My mother said then she would like to, to live until I have a business, a, a job. And she succeeded by t an accuracy of two weeks. And then she died. So when I was a civil engineer, um, this it was still an inherent uh, mentoring by my parents. But then I had a boss who his name was uh, König, Professor König. And he really uh, guided me through the next years. He and his partner in the civil engineering office, they allowed me to work on projects I, I could not imagine before. So the very first project was a, a huge hangar for, uh, for planes. I had no idea how to do it, but they gave me the trust and I, I could do it. And during all the time in this civil engineering office for 10 years, I always had this situation that they asked me to do really complicated things. And even when I made some mistakes, they did not kick me out, but they said, okay, this was a mistake. Let's look into it and let's see how we can together repair it. So they were great, great people. Unfortunately, Professor Koenig died a couple of weeks ago. Okay. And uh, you, in the early career, just after your uh, master's, you visited Japan to study uh, that, the earthquake. That, yeah, that was a very special story. It was about yeah. two years after, two or three years, three years after I was uh, entering this uh, engineering office. Morning at uh, something like uh, half past seven, this Professor Koenig came into my office and said, Mr. Werner, I have a project and we have to send somebody to Japan. Are you ready to go for one year? We will pay you uh, a uh, Japanese language course in Japan for one month. And then you should be able to speak Japanese. I did the same with uh, English. So this was just the invitation. I went home, asked my wife, and we decided, yes, we will do it. We will take the challenge. I was already married at that time. We will take the, the challenge. However... Uh, as my wife, Goni, she was not uh, ready with her education for being a, a teacher. I had to go alone first for half a year, and then she came out. So she, she, she joined me. So this this was a very special experience. So I was sent to Japan as a rather young guy. I was something like 28 years or something like that. And the Japanese could not understand that a young person like me comes with such a big responsibility. <laughs> so they, when I asked them, how old do you think I am? They said, ah, maybe 50, because they just could not understand that a person of 28 years can have the responsibility of earthquake-resistant design for German nuclear power plants. It was fascinating. Yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. So after you came back, and then you did uh, the PhD on the component building interactions during earthquakes, right? And so there were some major lessons that you learned from this trip. So could you el elaborate a bit on a few of these major lessons that you learned? I must tell you, it was a cultural shock, but a positive cultural shock for me, because it was the first time for me to stay abroad for more than a week. Uh, I, I was, of course, a holiday or something like that, but not during my study time. It was not common at that time. So I had to really to survive in a f totally foreign uh, culture. I could not speak Japanese when I when I came because he said you should learn it over there for, in, within one month. So it was really very difficult for me. I was so afraid even to take the tube, the sub the subway, because I wasn't sure whether I will find the exit. And so what I did the first weeks while learning Japanese in the center of Tokyo, I was walking through Tokyo. I was walking, not using taxi, not using the subway. And so this was uh, this was something which changed my mind to be open, to be ready to take risk in a personal manner. So, yes, that was excellent. And uh, I could use also the, 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 the topics over there because I was really, I was invited by Japanese to really see everything. So even they, they asked me, for instance, one day they said, ah, we invite you to go together with us to a nuclear power plant. I said, yes, we can do, yes. But this time you will have a very special chance. I said, what is it? You can enter the, the reactor. I said, I can enter the reactor? Yes, they said, we found a crack in the inner vessel. And maybe it's of interest for you. I said, no, it uh, might be of interest. Uh, but they really, they opened the vessel huh? 
and I could really enter into the, the nuclear vessel in the center of a nuclear power plant. It was really something. Uh, and um, so they gave me a lot of uh, trust also from the very beginning. And so uh, this then was also all what I did over there was finally the, the basis of my PhD, which I did also in this private engineering office. So I never went back to university. I did it in parallel to my work at the, in the, uh, in the uh, office. So you mentioned that you were professor for civil engineering at the TH Darmstadt. And uh, then after five years, you became the president. So uh, how was this transition from professor to dean? It was another accident. You see, there was, um, I was at the university and uh, at that time there was a strict difference between professors and uh, scientific uh, staff and uh, students and, no, and administrative staff. So there were four groups, so to say. And within the professors, there were different professors, more right wing, more left wing, more center wing and so on. And I was a member of one of these uh, groups of professors and we discussed and my my uh, predecessor at that time, the, the president who was still a president, wanted to, to be re-elected again for the sixth time, I think. Yes. And um, the member, the... Uh, no, it was the fourth time. It was for the fourth time. Fourth time. But we tried to uh, to elect him, and my group was against him. But anyhow, we tried to elect him, and he could not. He could not get the the uh, the number of votes he needed to become a president uh, to to be reelected. So we stopped the process, and then uh, we said, okay, how to go forward? And then it was me who said, let's let's. Do the process in a different way, not just looking for a person, but let's have a look for something like a profile we would like to have as a president of that university. The age, the uh, the, the subject, the orientation, blah, blah, blah. And at the end of this discussion, I was suddenly a candidate. So it was not planned like that, but it, that, that happened. And then I was really hesitating uh, to be a candidate. I even informed then that I will not go for that run. And they accepted that, yes. But then uh, after three or four days, I was thinking about it very, very heavily. They said, no, take the chance, jump out of the window. It's your chance to do it. And uh, I still remember that one. I, In the evening, I wrote a letter that I'm trying to become the uh, president. And I brought this uh, letter to one of these uh, groups and the very next morning I flew to Armenia for two or three weeks I don't remember exactly and I had no connection at all because there was no mobile phone or something like that no connection at all I did not know what they did with my letter no idea whether they say ah stupid guy he said no now why should we accept him um, and I came back and I got an invitation to go to a meeting and they said, Mr. Werner, you did very bad because you said you won't, won't be a candidate and now you say you are a candidate. What is, what is, what is the re real case? And we had a long discussion and then I was a candidate and I was elected by something like, I don't remember exactly, out of 90 votes of the special assembly i think i think i got something like 85 86 votes so it was 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 very nice and then the students brought me cake with gummy bears <laughs> and the number it was 85 gummy bears <laughs> and five in a different color <laughs> Very fantastic. It, it seems like you had a very nice uh, connection with your students yeah, as well yeah. back in the time. I went so, even when I was a pr president, there was some demonstration about, uh, against uh, the state uh, the state government over here. And I was in the first row together with the students. Yes, I had very good relations. That's fantastic to know. So this actually brings me on. So you were a professor of civil engineering and then you became the dean. And then uh, dean, uh, if you're dean in between, and then oh, sorry, you became the dean, and then yeah, you became the president right, right, of the university right. as well. And you mentioned before that when you were working at the company of for the civil engineering, you you did some uh, work designing airplane hangars. So yeah. is that where your interest in aviation and aerospace started? Uh, that started earlier. It started in 1957. Uh, 
that was the year when Sputnik was launched. Uh, and my father took me on his arm and said, look, Jan, there is Sputnik. And I had no idea what Sputnik is. But if your father tells you when you are three years old, there is something, you see something. So, uh, so I was following all these uh, activities. You see, I was uh, in the in the age you, you know the jumbo jet, huh? or you know the uh, hypersonic flight, uh, supersonic Concorde. All of all of them were produced in the, those years, in the early 60s. So it was really a, a time of high technology, and so it was for me just excellent to follow all of this. Uh, aeronautics and space activities. However, when I tried to enter the German Aerospace Center, it was not that easy because uh, DLR, the German Aerospace Center, is famous for uh, space and aeronautics, but also energy and transportation. And so they asked me, so please tell us what are, is your competence in those fields? And uh, first I said, look, if you select one person having a competence in one of these four topics in space, in aeronautics, or in energy, or in transportation, you will have an expert for that field, but maybe he or she will ignore the other fields. That's not good. So it's better to have no idea at, at all about subjects than to be focused. That was the starting, a, a joke at the beginning. But then I had a list of topics to show that in each and every topic, I had some experience. So, for instance, for aeronautics, um, I had uh, I built for helicopters. Uh, I built a stabilizing system. Now today it's easy with the computers, but early times it wasn't. Um, then also I calculated the aircraft impact on nuclear power plants. Um, and in order to do so, you have to know about the airplane. Otherwise, you cannot calculate it. So I went through all the different topics and showing that I have some experience from a civil engineering point of view. And so I was uh, elected for that position. Okay, so uh, moving along. So you became the chairman of the executive board of the German uh, Aerospace Center in 2007. So clearly you had certain goals that you wanted to achieve by that time. So, or some milestones that you wanted to accomplish. So how much of this were you able to... So I, I had a I had a motto for that at that time. It was one DLR, uh, because as I said, DLR had these four topics, uh, and we added one more that which was security. And uh, I wanted to to align or to to join the forces of the different topics uh, because I'm a strong believer that uh, interaction in different areas is for the benefit of uh, future developments. So one DLR was a message and I tried this uh, very strongly. In addition, I had always the idea to make participation a strong part of ESA, of DLR. Um, that means what I did is I uh, invented what was called DLR Interaction Tour, where I went from, uh, from institute to institute to meet the different people um, and the, the all ages uh, to discuss with them, not only with the, uh, with the leaders, the directors of the institutes, but with each and every uh, of them. Um, and we created uh, more and more what is called DLR School Lab, which opens the doors uh, of DLR for, uh, for our pupils. Okay, that's, uh, that's really cool. And so this was sort of the what i would say like, like a stepping stone for you to the isa uh, but it was not planned as a stepping it it was not planned like that it was a very nice activity i liked it from the first until the very last day um and i was asked in oh now i have to calculate uh 2014 2000 2010 yeah it might be 2010 I was asked whether I'm ready to move to ESA. And I said, mm -hmm. no, I'm not ready. By the way, the same happened when I was asked to go to meet to DLR. It was five years earlier than I finally went because mm -hmm. I also said I'm, I'm not finished at, at university. I wanted to first succeed with what is called the DLR, uh, the TUD Act. It's, it's a law. It's yeah. a law for Darmstadt. And the same was happening with uh, from going from DLR to ESA. 
So uh, then I was uh, again, uh, and then told me then in uh, 2000, 2000, I have to calculate again, 2010, you will never get the position because you once said no. And then in uh, 2015, uh, no, prior in 2014, uh, I was elected. Yeah, that's 2014. In the in, in December 2014, I was elected and started in 1st of July 2015. Yeah. Yeah. So exactly. So in 2015, you started as uh, director general of the ESA. Yeah. And you left in February 2021. Yeah. So February, this is right? this is another story. I had a contract yeah. for four years. Yeah. Uh, which would mean that my contract ends at. Uh, uh, 30th of June of 2019. That was the, the plan. So um, a director general of ESA can get an extension of four years mm -hmm. and in special cases, another extension of two or four years. So um, it was then in 2018 that there was a discussion of giving me an extension. And this is uh, one of the shadows in my life because uh, there were several discussions and the, the head of the French space agency, he wanted to have the job. He tried also right now, he could not succeed, but he wanted to get the job and he tried everything to kick me out. And he found a good, uh, a good reason for that. What he said is that I insulted the French president. He told that to all the member states of ESA. Jan Werner insulted the French president and therefore we cannot vote for him. And I was trying to find out what that is. And it was the following. In one meeting, internal ESA meeting, I showed two slides. I'm always showing slides, but there I showed two slides. One was showing the German Chancellor Angela Merkel with the then uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs, Mr. Westerwelle, who, who, was dead, who died afterwards, in astronaut suits. It was an, it was an advertisement, huh? a commercial. And I said, you see, that's the reason why Germany is always positive for human space flight. And I showed another picture also, get, I did not do that. I, I took it from internet. Another one also from internet showing the president of France, Francois Hollande, uh, launching like a rocket from the Elysee Palace with engines instead of legs. Okay, and so you see, that is the reason, which is true, that France is always supporting launches. And this guy, this head of the French uh, space agency believed that this is insulting. So the story is long, I have to tell you. So I then got a phone call from a, a German parliamentarian and he told me, Ayan, you know, I always like you, but we cannot support you any longer because you insulted the French president. And I said, what the hell is that? Yeah. We heard it from the French ambassador in, in Berlin. And I, I, I found out that it was this guy from France who had told that to all the ambassadors in the different member states. Um, and sometimes he explains the situation that I had an ugly photo of their president, which was not ugly at all. It was a, a funny picture, nothing more than that. So I called Francois Hollande and said, Mr. Hollande, you know the story? He said, no, I don't know, sorry. I told him, you see, um, I showed this slide, I explained to him, and um, I would like to apologize if this is insulting for you. And he said, it's not insulting, it's funny, it's good. I support you, Mr. Werner. So I called the ambassador in Paris, in Berlin, and said, you see, I called him, uh, no, you see, I tell you the story. She said, you don't have to tell me the story, I know all details. I said, this is good. But, but just hear it. I told her the full story and she said, oh, oh, oops. Now I have to send a letter to the French government because what they told me is wrong. But I'm sure they will find another reason. 
so at the end of a long, long discussion, I proposed, you see in ESA, every three years, there is what is called a ministerial meeting. Every three years, the, the director general has to present his ideas and get the money from the, from the member states. So, and I said, you see, three years, and the director general is elected every four years. This does not fit. So I said, why not change that to six, three, three, instead of four, four, four? And therefore, I offer that you uh, elect me just for another two years. And so finally, I was, I was extended for two years, but uh, the real reason was not my brave idea or smart idea. The real uh, reason was this uh, insulting story. So, and um, then my period was prolonged and I took it. You could say, why did you take it? Why did you not say that's enough? But in 2019, there was another ministerial and I wanted to have that uh, to, for ESA. So I said, no, I take the two years. And by the way, I'm old enough. So um, I'm now 66, nearly 67. So I took the two years, which would lead me until the end of June of this year. And then uh, my successor was selected in uh, November last year, finally elected in December 17th. And um, he immediately and very, in an unfair way, took over all, uh, tried to took, take over all responsibilities and decisions. And so I decided I will not stay for another six months. He's an internal candidate, a person from inside. So I decided not to stay for another six months and uh, having all the time uh, this uh, double double heading situation. So I said, it's not good for the for ESA if they have two DGs and incoming and uh, the outgoing, if both are in the same in the same organization. It's not good for him. It's not good for me. So I decided to leave. And so I left on the 28th of February. Okay. Long story. That's I have a... to apologize. No, it, it's, it's a fascinating story, actually. It's a story really showing that Germans do have a sense of humor. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, and sometimes people misunderstand that yeah. uh, it, it's a unique sense of humor. Yeah. In fact, yeah. So uh, actually, in in the, in the in your farewell blog. But you see, uh, this is the I, I can show you uh, pictures which I think where I would which I would never use. I saw a picture of Emmanuel Macron having his uh, mask over here, not in the. And, is, uh, and he is quoted at that time, don't forget your mask. Huh? But he has it over here. This is not fine. This is this is a type of humor I would not use. So mine was not at all aggressive. Not at all. Definitely. Yeah. No, we completely agree. We, we, we actually found the whole story rather riveting. Yeah. And uh, so what it leads me into the piece that you wrote in your farewell blog, where you said you categorize your term at ESA as space 4.0. Yeah. So what is space 1.0, 2.0, 3.0? Ah, okay, that's a good question. Yes, uh, I can explain you. Now I have to think about it, what it really was 1.0, 1, 1, 2, 3. 1.0 1. 1. was astronomy because uh, people were entering into space even without going. Yeah. Space 2.0 was race in space. The race in space. The 60s. Uh, 3.0 is more cooperation, um, like with the International Space Station and others. And now, and that was the idea, we are entering into 4.0, which is a total shift of paradigm, more commercialization, uh, more participation, not only the big ones, but very distributed activities um, and so on. Uh, also artificial intelligence, all the modern technologies. So that is 4.0. So it's, it has a link to Industry 4.0, which is used in Germany as well. So it's a, a similar approach. Interesting. That also brought us uh, to another topic. So when you look back at your time at ESA, um, we saw that, that many goals were set. And um, we're wondering, in your eyes, um, how, many, how many were accomplished and... Uh, where is, is more work needed? And also among all the, the goals, which was your favorite? And which one maybe was your biggest achievement? 
So I'm I'm never say about big achievements, and I never use the word I'm proud of. This is uh, I will never use uh, either. So and by the way, I always don't ask answer the question what is the most interesting project or something like that because I was a director general, not the director special. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> I, finally, I made uh, something like uh, my personal evaluation of the six years. And I said, it's with, with one hand, you can explain it. Number one is one Europe. United space in Europe, one Europe. Number two, two main players in Europe, ESA and the European Union. Three, three addressees of space activities, which is the society at large, economy, and environment. Environment on the surface of the Earth, like climate change, and environment in space, uh, space garbage, etc., uh, etc. Et four is four pillars of ESA. That's the narrative. What is ESA doing? Science and exploration, um, safety and security, applications enabling and support. So these are the four pillars of ESA. And number five, are the five roles ESA can take. Number one is, like in the past, a research and development agency. Number two, a partner of industry and public-private partnership. Number three, um, a customer of industry buying a service. Number four, to be an enabler of the countries, of the member states, as well as of industry to enter space. And number five, to be a broker. For instance, if somebody wants to go to the moon, but it does not have a rocket. Another one has a, a rover and another one has whatever. So to bring them together to be a broker. So these are the five roles. So one, two, three, four, five. These are more or less is the overall picture of what I believe I tried to realize. And the, if, you, if you ask about achievement, then I would say really that it is all these five. All these five at the same exactly. time. It's progression on all fronts. There is not one special one. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So this actually leads me to another question because you just mentioned uh, a rover. And so there's a lot of uh, interest now in Mars, like Mars is the hot topic. But uh, are people done with the moon? So is nobody interested in the moon anymore? No. You see, moon and Mars are really quite different. And we learned a lot, a lot about the moon in the last uh, five to ten years. When I started to discuss about space, and I said, okay, why not go to the moon? People told me, don't go there. It's a dead stone. Uh, we were there already. There is nothing to, to discover. But meanwhile, we know that there is a lot to discover. There is water on moon, uh, on, the, on the moon. There is uh, uh, there are technologies we can develop on the moon. It's, it's a stepping stone to go further. And also, if you go to the far side of the moon, you can have a deep view into the uh, into the universe. So the moon is an interesting place. This is number one. Number two is uh, if you compare moon and Mars from the distance, uh, it's not uh, the same like uh, to go from Frankfurt to Mainz and then next time to go from Frankfurt to Munich. It's a totally different story to go to Mars. It takes two years to go there and back. And that means if you go with humans and you have after three days a problem, whatever of type, or you have after two months a health problem, then you have to stay until two. Uh, you have to stay two years. You cannot go back in between. While if you go to moon to the moon, you you, you can tur- can go uh, around the moon once, like Apollo 13, and you are back within one week. So they are really totally different. I'm sure humans will go to Mars, but not so fast. And what is my what, what I'm really afraid about is is about discussions to uh, have a colony on Mars, uh, and then that people go there forever. The Mars is not a nice environment. And uh, normally I'm always supporting scientists, but Stephen Hawking, he said maybe because of climate change, it because of environmental problems we have on Earth, we have to go to another planet. And I believe this is a very bad excuse not to take care of our nice pale blue dot, uh, the, the, the Earth. So I believe humans should go to the moon. Humans should go to Mars. We should go with other spacecraft even further into the solar system, but not because uh, the Earth is bad, but because the Earth is nice. So we found on the planet Venus, 
we found the climate change, which we now know is also happening on Earth. Uh, and so, therefore, exploration is always something which brings us also more knowledge about the Earth. So I believe the moon is close enough to go there, and but next time not in race in space, not back to the moon, as the American Vice President Mike Pence said, back to, we go back to the moon. I say we go forward to the moon. That means next time we go there together. And we should stay there, not forever, but for some research uh, days or weeks or whatever, um, and to go there in a in a cooperative way. And therefore, I said, let's have it as a multi-partner open concept. That was my wording. And I explained that to a journalist, and he said, Mr. Werner, it's a nice idea, but it's not good to sell. You have to find a better word. And then we created Moon Village which some people misunderstood. And I got letter, emails, uh, people who said, yes, I can I can build you a single house or whatever. And one was asking to be the mayor of that uh, moon village. That was not the idea. Multi-partner open concept. That was the idea. And this is now reality. So I'm very happy because now uh, the different countries uh, are going to the moon and they go there together. Okay, the American wants to go a little bit faster, but... Okay, they can do that. But the next time when uh, a spacecraft with humans will go to the moon, it will be with Europe, together with Europe. So that's fine. Yeah. Um, I have also another uh, question. So you mentioned potential commercialization of, uh, of also uh, air travel. And I guess one would expect the air space also to become more crowded in the years to come. Um, so... I'm also wondering um, when we think of the airspace as a common good of humanity, right? But then maybe also personal interests or um, economic interests come in. And uh, so, for example, we we're wondering what do you what do you think of space force? So basically, when countries try to mark the territory in in space, and do you think sh uh, Europe should do something ar along these lines? Any type of militaristic action in space uh, will never get my support, never ever. Uh, and and there, there are sometimes excuses saying defense is not military. I don't accept that. So uh, you see in the Convention of ESA it says exclusively peaceful purposes. And therefore, this is my line. I think it's a good sentence from 1975. And therefore, I'm against uh, any air uh, space force activities or so. Or uh, sometimes it's said, yes, we we can we, we can build robots in space fighting others, etc. You don't need robots to fight others in space. You can just send a block of concrete; it can destroy all the other uh, satellites. But what I'm more afraid about is what you said: is that it becomes crowded, not by by astronauts, uh, but by uh, by satellites. So you see, for instance, Elon Musk is building a mega constellation with 10,000s of uh, satellites and others as well. And um, this is really a danger. We had already some some accidents, uh, Iridium and Cosmos, two satellites, a Russian and uh, an American, they collided and produced uh, 10,000s of uh, sp small particles. And Uh, there was a nearby collision between one of the satellites of Elon Musk, uh, Starlink uh, mega constellation and an ESA uh, satellite. So this is something I'm afraid about. And therefore, I tried for several years to convince member states to pay for a mission to reduce space junk. And it was very difficult because they said, ah, there is enough space and it's not our uh, it's not our problem. Uh, but finally, we got the money in 2019, so we will crap at least one space debris to bring it down to show that it is possible. And I'm sure that this is a business in future, also a commercial business. Okay, so I'm going to take a tangential direction from here. So you in, and you also mentioned in your farewell blog that the COVID-19 pandemic affected work everywhere. And it also had positive impacts. So how was how, what were the positive impacts during your tenure at NASA and also perhaps some negative impacts? Yeah. So I still hope for the positive effect of of solidarity. This is still to be seen. I'm not so convinced that this is very strong because if you see how people behave, it's not really showing that one. But what happens is uh, digital transformation. 
when I started in ESA to try to convince people that we should have more digitalization, digital transformation of all the processes, people told me that is not secure enough, uh, signatures is not secure enough, enough, et cetera, et cetera. Now, suddenly with COVID, they had to do it. They had to follow it. And I can tell you, there is a big impact, a positive impact when we... Um, when we uh, pay for contracts for for builds of industry, normally it takes something like or it should it it took something like twenty five days, a little bit longer, a little bit shorter, uh, from the point of from the time of receiving a bill until we paid it. Now it's below eight days, so this is really a rapid acceleration without reducing quality or something like that. So a digital signature is now a common good. Another thing is. I was traveling like hell in my period of DG. Now, uh, I found it as a shock last year that I could not uh, travel any longer. But I must say for, let's say, 60 or 70 percent of the travels, it is enough if you have the link via, uh, via Zoom or whatever instrument. So it is not replacing personal contacts uh, and it's not replacing um, brain work. But it is reducing uh, a lot of travels, and therefore it's also good for our uh, environment. So I'm sure that this will will continue. We will see less business travels. I still believe that the private travels will increase again because uh, people are not ready to see just the the the, vision, the, the, the movies about uh, Mallorca or whatever place. They want to go there and see it. Uh, but uh, for, for business travel, I see a big reduction in the future, and this is good. Um, personally, again, uh, I always say, uh, if you want to solve in a, in a meeting question number C, and you know A and B, then you can do it in a virtual meeting. But if you have no clue about A and B, you have to meet. Meaning, a clear question of, 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 a, of a direction, you can do it also uh, during a video link, but if you really need to 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 work together as one brain, then I think still personal meetings uh, with body language and all of this uh, is For helpful. Sure. So uh, we move along to the next stage in your career. So we, this brings me to Akatech and the future. So j before we move to the question about your current position, so you've been a member of the Akatech Senate since 2004. Right. And so over this period since 2004 is almost uh, 17 years now. So have you observed the way science has evolved over this period or, or the way? You know, I, I, you see, I'm a member of Akatech. I have a member of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Science. I'm a member of the Leopoldina uh, Academy of Science. And I must say this job as a president and as a, uh, the DG of ESA more or less stopped me by participating in this uh, uh, work. So the, I had some presentations in Akatec uh, in between this period, sometimes some links with Leopoldina, some with uh, Berlin Brandenburg, but only very minor. Now that I am have much more time, uh, I'm revitalizing all of these activities. So I'm not only in Akatech uh, more active, but also at Leopoldina and at Berlin Brandenburg. So th that's just a question of time, uh, which was difficult for me. And by the way, this is also an advantage of the digital transformation. Now, you can have all of these meetings uh, from home. and don't have to travel to Berlin or wherever. Yeah, congratulations to the recent recently being elected president of Akatech. Um, and you were, quote, you were quoting the author of Le Petit Prince, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. Um, as for the future, your task is not to foresee it, but to enable it. Yeah, that's a good story because I used this quote already at Darmstadt. I moved to DLR. I used it proactively again from my point. But this time, I did not inform the Akatech people that uh, this is uh, one of my favorite quotes. And they pro uh, proposed a, a, a document for the welcome message, and they put it in. And I was very happy about that. Uh, this is uh, uh, Saint-Exupéry is really a nice thing, because this is 
always a problem that people believe they can really decide the future. The future is unknown. Whatever you decide, the future may be different. So therefore, uh, to make people ready for the future, to make a country ready for the future, to make an institution ready for the future, this is the main goal and not to try to forecast the future in details. That's that's bullshit. But in, in how far do you think like um, the political environment um, has an has an impact on how scientific policy decisions are made like mm. so it's it depends very much on the different uh, on the different institutions um, in ESA the situation is that the director general proposes something and the member states can follow or not follow now you can say but then they can influence they can but if if the director general is of a good Good, is a good guy. Let's say just if he or she is a good guy, he will not just look for some money, but for visionary projects and try to convince the member states of that and not the other way around, not following the money directly. This is a danger, of course, it can happen. In DLR, it was a little bit different because DLR is very much linked directly to the politics. So that's uh, that was different. Um, and they were the, the bureaucrats and the ministry were very afraid in DLR that I do the same as with the university bringing the DLR to a more, more autonomous organization. They were really afraid, and they told me that they are afraid about me. But uh, anyhow, it's, it's, DLR survived me. So, um, so therefore, from a personal point of view, I never had the feeling that politicians or politics could change my opinions. That means, of course, I'm listening and if there are good arguments, then I take them, but not, uh, not to follow them just because they are the masters. I think each and everyone has to, to stay himself or herself. Definitely. And do you think that's one of the... But it's a little bit arrogant for me, yeah. So I have a salary, <laughs> I have everything. So I don't. As, as you could say it like that, but I did this from the very first day. Even with uh, when I was in this engineering office, I remember a day, Professor König gave me a task to calculate, recalculate an existing bridge, and I did it, and I, it was clear for me that this bridge will fall down. So I went in his office and said, Professor König. Um, I'm afraid this bridge is not okay. Uh, and he said, you young guy believe it's not okay? I said, yes, it's not okay. And I tried to convince him, but uh, he wasn't, he, he said, a bridge will not fall down just because you are calculating that. That was, he was very tough, huh? tough against what I was saying. But I uh, stayed with my opinion. And uh, then uh, one year later, they uh, had to renovate the full bridge. So, Uh, finally, I was right. And therefore, what I say is, even if it's dangerous, to, if, if, in the private, the private business, if you are against what your master is saying, it's a little bit dangerous. Huh? But I, have, I, 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 I was always lucky that uh, my masters finally accepted that I'm like that. Excuse me, Sinat, you said something. No, no. So I was just trying to make the connection that, so clearly having a, an important opinion on certain things, at least from a scientific point of view, is essential. So how do you plan on improving this level of this communication between the government policy, the, the way science is done and stuff like that? So the best thing is to be open, transparent, explain things. You see, right now people are talk, talking about quantum technology. Everybody is talking about... And then they say in German, Quantensprünge. Uh, quantum leaps. Ask a person when he is using that uh, whether he can, can explain you what it is. Is it something big or is it something small? Uh, that's interesting. So what I believe is we have to explain. We have to explain what really the things are. Another thing was nanomaterial. Nano. I ask. I ask a politician. Uh, so you are talking about nanomaterial. What is nanomaterial? Can you explain me what is nano? I have no clue. Do you know, do you believe they could say that nano is just 10 to the power of minus nine? They had no clue about that. They said it's some special material, uh, like blue material or green material, it's nano material. So uh, this is what I believe is we have to be transparent. We have to explain 
and then politicians have to make up their mind to decide. Yes, but we have to be clear. We have to be just crystal clear and don't hide behind any argument and, and give a good narrative. You have to have narratives, especially science has to give good narratives that people can understand. When you ask people, what is NASA? The first reaction is first man on the moon. NASA is much more than that. So therefore, you need a narrative. And that was the reason I defined these four pillars for ESA. I explained to you earlier, or the three, uh, the three addressees, um, or the five roles, because then you suddenly you can, you can make you understood. And this is what I believe is so important. And uh, along these lines, we talk about narratives. Um, do you have like a vision or a possible narrative in mind for, for your future years, maybe in the Leopoldina or for Akatech? What you want my next step is my coffin. <laughs> <laughs> not no. yet. <laughs> no, I did not say when, but <laughs> no, I will try. I mean, I was very surprised when I was suddenly asked. Uh, so on the, in the first week, I think it was in the first week of January that I announced that I will not continue uh, beyond the 28th of February. Uh, and immediately I got some very nice offers from companies and countries, blah, 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 blah. I was very hesitant to take any of them. And then uh, in the it was in the end of January or even beginning of February, I don't know exactly. I got a phone call and somebody asked me about, uh, Are you, uh, would you like to be president of Akatech? And I said immediately, yes. No further discussion because all the experience I have also from Frankfurt Airport, the mediation at Frankfurt Airport and all of this, I believe I can bring something to the society by joining science and uh, economy for the better of the society and the world. It's a big word, but I mean it. Definitely. So I think this kind of leads us into the final uh, question that we at least final scripted question that we have so do you have any words of wisdom for younger researchers like us any like about time management how I you manage will, your I days i always uh, i get sometimes the same question and i always say no i will not give you any advice because each and every one is a unique person in this uh, nice world and you have to find your own way don't uh, be shy Stay curious. Uh, that's the main uh, main thing. Um, so it's um, uh, it's really that I believe that uh, Stephen Jobs was uh, was saying, "Stay." Uh, what did he say? Stay. He stay said a very hungry, nice stay word. Foolish. Stay foolish. Stay, stay hungry, foolish. Stay foolish. Yeah. Stay, stay hungry. Stay foolish. I think this is the best you can you can say. Stay hungry. Stay foolish. Meaning. Don't limit yourself to whatever is said to you. And don't follow advices of old wise men. That's the worst you can do. <laughs> and uh, I was actually looking for a specific quote uh, about time management from you. So uh, no, no. You see, uh, it's really so so different from by person to person. I have three kids. And they are behaving so differently with the time management they have, and all three are happy in a way. I think there is also no uh, no uh, no special formula, no no magic formula for that. It's uh, it's. <sighs> you see, we say in German the work life balance. Huh? It's one of the words, and I had to give a talk where I should say uh, the balance of work and f family i think it was uh, and i i i made a mistake and said uh, please take care of the balance between work and job <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah exactly <laughs> so therefore i believe that this is something each and everyone has to find out where he or she gets his personal satisfaction, whether it's in work or in family life or in both. There is no yeah, magic formula, definitely. not at all. No, I remember you once told me, like when we met last time, you said, uh, yeah. I use 24 hours every day and if I need more time, I use the night, right? So. Yeah, exactly. But this is, this, is, uh, this is also not the best. Huh? I can tell you now that I'm... 
I, uh, that I'm out of ESA, I call it the retiree blues. Because uh, suddenly I don't have this 24 plus uh, situation. And it's also not so nice to uh, to learn how to handle it. So each and every one should find its own way. Yeah, I can imagine because it seems like you continuously look for new challenges, right? Yeah. Like this yeah. is really impressive. Yeah. yeah. But now I'm nearly 67 and uh, yeah, I don't know what to say. There's this song, no? With 66 years, life, yeah, six, yeah, yeah, life yeah, yeah. starts. It's a German song. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's okay. It's fantastic. So it's okay. been an absolute pleasure talking to you and uh, we really enjoyed the stories that you had to tell us. And uh, Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And stay healthy huh? and get your vaccination as soon as possible. All right, there you have it. We really hope you enjoyed the discussion with Professor Werner. We really enjoyed making it and it was a lot of fun learning from him and understanding the different stories that he had to say about his career. Unfortunately, due to time, we couldn't ask him a few more questions, like especially about the part that he uh, mentioned that it was not a straight line, but maybe another time where we can get him back on the podcast and have this discussion. Anyway, I think that's it from us. And see you all next week. It's a bye-bye from me and a bye from Leonie. Bye. Magazine. The podcast is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD in the Science Communication Working Group from the Sea of Magazine. The intro outro music is composed by Trinidad Ramkumar and the pre-intro music is composed by Gustavo Carrizzo. This episode of the Austrian Podcast was produced by Trinidad Ramkumar and Leonie Keller and it was edited by Trinidad Ramkumar. If you'd like to give us any feedback, comments or suggestions, please feel free to write to us at offspring.podcasts at phcnet.mpg.de and feel free to follow us at Twitter at mpphcnetpodcast or on Instagram at offspringmagazine underscore the podcast. We'll see you all out there. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, and see you all next week. Bye-bye.